Hey, sweet listeners. Thanks for tuning in to the NetSuite podcast. I'm your host, Kendall Fisher. On this episode, we sat down with Nick Sinegalia, the chief accounting officer at OnDeck, one of the leaders in online small business lending and a NetSuite customer. Nick explains how OnDeck reinvented online lending and why this unique business proposition is important for small business owners. He also explains the genesis of OnDeck and how they grew from a concept into a lucrative business. Of course, overcoming a couple bumps in the road by taking the proper steps, including implementing NetSuite, to gain their bearings, manage efficiencies, and scale. That's all coming up next. You're listening to the NetSuite Podcast where we discuss what's happening within NetSuite, why we're doing it, and where we're heading in the future. We'll dive into the details about the software and the people at NetSuite who are behind all the moving parts. We'll also feature customer growth stories, discussing the ups and downs of running a company and how one integrated system can help your business continue to scale. Before we get into this interview with Nick Sinegalia from OnDeck, I wanna thank our sponsors over at The Second City. Here's a little business insight that's almost too good to be true. Learning works best when you're laughing. Second City Works, the B2B side of the comedy mecca, The Second City, unleashes the improv methods pioneered on their world-famous stages to help companies and individuals improve performance. Their professional development programs unlock better ways to communicate, collaborate, and innovate, all the while laughing till you learn. Visit secondcityworks.com to find out more. Hey, Nick, thank you so much for joining us today on the NetSuite podcast. We're stoked to have you today. Really nice to be here. And it's a beautiful day in New York City. And I haven't been here since 2013, if you can believe it. So it's a long time. A long time. So I'm, I'm excited to be here and it's beautiful weather. So hot, but, but great. You get the good weather. Yeah, exactly, exactly. So, um, you know, for starters, I want just to have you tell our listeners who might not know what OnDeck is and what you guys do as a company. Sure. So OnDeck is pretty much one of the leaders of uh, online small business lending. That is pretty much everything we do. Our entire focus is to get capital and funding into the hands of entrepreneurs and small businesses. That is what we were born to do. Where did this idea stem from and why was there a market need for a company like OnDeck at the very start? So it, it's it's not rocket science. I mean, banks are very good at doing what they do, which is lending money to, as the joke always goes, lending money to people who don't need money. Um, that's how you got approved for a loan. You had to prove you don't need money. So there is just a huge gap in the world of small businesses of just having access to funding. There is the extremely small businesses when someone starts up and they're in the house and they go to mom, dad, brother, sister, whoever, can I have $50 or $100? Uh, and then there's you know the small businesses of the world that just need capital but just are not uh, serviced by banks. So there was just an enormous need of what is probably the biggest uh, economic driver in this country of small businesses that just did not have adequate access to capital. Now we're going to get to that um, in a little bit because I do want to I do want to touch on that. But first, can you tell us who started the company and when? Sure. So Miss Jacob started the company give or take ten years ago. Mm-hmm. Uh, he was the one that basically said, "Hey, there's you know millions and millions of small businesses out there that can't get money, and I got a better way to do it." So yeah. it started about ten years ago. Mitch started that up. He was employee number one. Love it. I actually have, um, at NetSuite, we've worked with Samantha Edis, his wife. Oh, right. Is that right? <laughs> yeah. Um, she's great. And so, Small yeah. world. Right? And both entrepreneurs, which, mm-hmm. is, which is really cool. Um, so w- what do you think is the unique proposition of OnDeck that sets you guys apart, you know, from other lending companies? So OnDeck is, you know, our whole thing was simplicity, ease, human touch. So right now, you know, for a small business to get a loan, it is cumbersome. They don't know necessarily. These are entrepreneurs. These are not people with finance backgrounds or accounting mm-hmm. backgrounds. These are people that have uh, a desire and, and, you know, their life is what their business is. That's what they know. They don't necessarily know how do I go about raising capital. So uh, the basic premise of the company was to make it easy for a company or a person, we are small business lending, not consumer, but to be able to go online and with some basic simple questions and basically we guide you through the whole process of asking for information, being able to have someone very simply fill out 
uh, a financing application and obtain funding as fast as same day. Can you explain a little bit more in depth how OnDeck offers entrepreneurs and small businesses over other competitors? I mean, what is it that OnDeck's offering with these unique practices? So in in the beginning, uh, you know, going back 10 plus years, there really were the banks. Right? Yeah. There was no online right, lending. Right, that's right. why we were a disruptor, right. Right? The, the term that's used a lot. Mm-hmm. So if you were a small business and you wanted money, you had to go to a bank. You had to spend hours and hours and days and days filling out applications and then waiting weeks and months to get an, uh, an answer, which most often was a denial. It just, mm-hmm. it, they just couldn't, did, banks didn't know how to lend to uh, these small businesses. Then on the other end of the spectrum came about the payday lenders, uh, which was, here's a little bit of money, we're going to charge you exorbitant interest rates, typically get you in what was known as like a death spiral of where you can't, the only thing you could do is borrow more money next week. Right. Um, so we basically, back in, in when Mitch started the company, basically came up a way to not necessarily go in and uh, measure someone's credit based on just their FICO score. Right. right. It was what else can we do to actually measure or predict is, is the the best way of saying it. Predict if this business you know is, is going to be successful and has something to it that we can take the risk of lending it money. So we came up with our own proprietary scoring system. Right. So we basically we would ask certain information and gather certain uh, you know in the days of the internet you would put in an application you know our system would actually go out and gather data from from the internet about you more than just your FICO score and based on that we were able to make a credit decision which was completely different than the way a bank might do so. Right, right. That's really interesting. Yeah. Um, is that a bit controversial with everything going on in the world right now in terms of like data and and I I don't think so because it it's you know it, a lot of it is we're just really data mining stuff that's out yeah. there. You know, for for instance, I always used to laugh when they used to tell the story that if a restaurant would come online, which was one of our bigger customer types, mm-hmm. uh, and put in an application, our system would actually go to Yelp mm. and look at reviews. Interesting. Now, do we, frankly, do we, uh, is it our business or, or do we really care how good your uh, chicken franchise is on Yelp? No, but there's things we can gather by going to Yelp. For instance, if a customer says, a potential customer says, I'm a restaurant, I've been in business six years, I do X amount of revenue, we basically know statistically that if we go check out Yelp, they should have about 120, 150 reviews. Yeah. And if we don't see that, it might be a red flag and it can actually allow us to look further. So there's a lot of things we do online, again, just that is above and beyond just a FICO score that's going to basically help us make a credit decision on. So I don't think anyone is really opposed to it. We're right, just really course. mining data that's out there. Yeah. Um, so it, it's been helpful to them. I mean, it's, I, you know, this is something that's actually helping them, not harming them. Now, what about if it's a, you know, somebody that's coming to you that doesn't have their business in place yet? You know, say it's somebody that wants to start a restaurant but doesn't have the funds to do so. Even as we'd like to think we're out there for the small business world, there are criteria of course. That, that, that customers, uh, you know, need to meet. They need to be in business for at least a year. They need to be revenue generating. You know, we're not seed capital. Yeah. Um, unfortunately for that, maybe you still do have to go to mom and dad. Yeah. Um, but there are, you know, there are minimum requirements that customers need to meet to be eligible for yeah. loans from on deck. Um, but they're certainly different than what you're going to have from a typical financial institution. And what tips would you have for, you know, the listeners who are tuning in that are looking for funding and that, you know, do have a little bit of experience under their belt and meet that criteria? First and foremost is, you know, as far as we go, check out the website, right? Yeah. Um, we're going to have lots of information on there that's going to help you. On Deck tries not only to, you know, be there as a partner to small businesses out there and as a uh, resource for capital. But there's also a lot of information on our websites that you can get for helping your business Mm -hmm. and to answer just those questions you're talking about. How do I set myself up uh, and set my business up to be able to, to, to get capital down the road? What are the right things I need to do? I mean, we could do an entire podcast on just that and probably a whole series on that um, of what do people need to do. At the end of the day, things have to be done right. You can't just slap lipstick on a pig and, you know, it's, yeah. okay, that's a good company. You know, it's got to be a company that's structured right and set up right and set up for success, um, you know, the, in order to get capital. Mm-hmm. Um, so there are certain things that, you know, you can do. You have to structure your business properly. You know, you have to be ethical. You know, mm-hmm. you have to – all the things you would typically think of doing of growing a successful business, treating the customer right, all these things, you know, that's what you need to do. There's no shortcut. I wish there could say there's a shortcut or here – Here's steps A, B, and C, and if you do these things, you know, your company's going to be throwing money at you. Yeah. If I knew what those three, three things were, I probably wouldn't be sitting here. I'd be on an island somewhere, you know, soaking in the sun. Right. Um, there's, there's no shortcuts to it. It's, yeah. you know, it's, it's working hard, and these people, 
uh, these business people that come to on deck do just that. I mean, these are people that, you know, the average entrepreneur is doing 60, 70 hours a week working their butt off. Right. Um, and those are the things that typically you need to do to build a successful business. Right. A FICO score can't like put that person in a in that bucket. You know, it's how many hours they're putting in. It's those Yelp reviews. It's the, you know. Yeah, it's all the different things they're doing to build the business. A, a FICO score, you know, is one small piece small of piece, things that are right. looked at. Uh, there's lots of other things, you know, you know, I think most businesses don't make it five years, right? Yeah. Um, which is partly why, you know, we're in such a unique space. A lot of the businesses we lend to, mm -hmm. and our loans might be 12 months, 24 months, um, they may be three years or four years old. Um, so you almost look at it and say, hey, you're lending to a business that odds are right. aren't going to make it to the fifth year. Yeah. You know? So that's why we're very careful about what we do. And, and we've you know, worked for, for a decade, really, building our credit scoring capabilities um, to be able to properly predict. Um, but we're, again, we're, we're trying to be there for small businesses pretty much for the, the, their whole lifespan. And what about data aside? What about the product or the business itself? Do you guys take into consideration what it is that they're doing and where they fit in the industry? We lend to probably, oh, well, not probably, we lend to over 700 different industries. We are not a specialty finance company where yeah. we only do medical or we only do restaurants. There are a few that for ethical or moral or, or different reasons we might stay away from. Not many. <laughs> um, but there are a few that are just not in our wheelhouse. But pretty much we run the gamut on different industries. So, you know, we've gathered so much data over you know 10 years you have a good lending. idea yeah, we, we have a good idea of you know which types of industries have seasonality which ones are are, are doing good when which ones are doing poorly when mm -hmm. um you know we pretty much can judge each and each independent industry based on all the data we've gathered over the years what are you seeing right now trending wise in what respect? For example, retail. I mean, I know there's a lot of conversation around retail and you know the changing with Amazon. And what trends are you seeing in terms of like, okay, this is not some a company that maybe we want to lend to right now, or this is definitely right now is the time to do it. Yeah, I, I think generally speaking, and we can you know without getting into all the details as to why, I think the, the economy seems to be showing a lot of positive uh, direction to it right now. Yeah. Um, if you want to do that, just based on my family spending, clearly things must be great. Um, <laughs> so, uh, sorry, 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 honey, you know, don't, uh, so um, I'm not in the aspect of the business that's generating, right. uh, you know, keeping an eye on the economy and, and predicting the future. But, you know, from what I see, you know, just in my own opinion, th things appear pretty positive in the business economic world. So, you know, I see things, you know, things look pretty positive, right? You know, yeah. there's, there's some skepticism. I think the biggest thing right now is just uncertainty. Right. You know, there's lots of the, the tax law just changed. And, right. uh, you know, certainly in our business, there's regulatory things that are, um, you know, uh, lots of uncertainty around it. That's, I think, the, the biggest thing right now is not so much is it good or is it bad, but what is it going to be? You know, it's right. great right now, but what's it going to be tomorrow? Right, exactly. Uh, and, you know, if, again, who's got that crystal ball? But right. you, you take the good for when it's good. On a previous podcast, we talked about this and how, you know, between blockchain and AI and everything else, um, you know, these, everybody's just like, what is going to happen next? Like in two days, something could change. And so, you know, I always like to think that the best thing that you can do to prepare for that is just to be open to, to, to be flexible, to yeah. be open to it. Yeah. I mean, you know, if, I guess like any normal strategy of, you know, not putting all your eggs in one basket and, and diversifying and, and, you know, maybe that's not the entrepreneur's way. Maybe they got where they are because they do put all their eggs in one basket right. and they, they go wholehearted in one direction. You know, I'm, uh, I wish I had the crystal ball to, to, yeah. to be able to predict, but... Uh, if you did, you'd be on that island. Again, I'd be. There's a lot of things that can get me on that island, and I haven't yet achieved one of them. No, well, you know, and, and going back to the start of of on deck, this was clearly something different. You guys created a category for yourselves. Do you can you speak to some of the company's early successes and challenges, and how the team overcame those before you came on? And then I really want to get into the stuff that you kind of faced when you came on in 2014. Sure. So, I mean, some of the the history I've gotten second, third, and fourth hand. Of course. And, you know, the old the uh, yeah the urban legends in right. the office and stuff like that. But they talked. About about the days when they just started and you know uh, where they were you know spending a lot of time for before they even made their first loan you know and it was it was very much in the beginning we're about to try and build a business that we have no idea if people are going to buy into yeah right? we know the need is out there but can we pull it off mm -hmm. 
And so, you know, they were they tell the stories of back in the day where they would make one or two or three loans a day and, you know, they were jumping up and down yeah. on the table. And then it started to take off. And it's all based on just data, right? You know, if you get 10 pieces of data in that's allowed, you know, you can make a good decision. When you get 100 pieces of data in, you can make an even better decision. Right. So I think in the beginning, a lot of it was merely around, you know, getting a foothold in and start getting access to the data. Um, you know, and I'm sure they, you know, they built a proprietary system and that I'm sure was a challenge. You know, you're, you're building something that doesn't exist right. Right, from the ground up. And, and uh, I'm sure, you know, going through it, there were the bugs that they had to work out and the kinks that they had to work out. But then it, you know, it took off. Right. And, you know, back in the days prior to me joining them, they, it got to the point where, as you know, it got to the point where they were ready to do an IPO. Right. So they had the normal challenges that any small business does. They were in a small office here in the city with, you know, two or four or eight or 10 or 20 people as mm -hmm. it built up, struggling like everybody else and needing money like everybody else. And they went out and, you know, had to raise money just like the people were servicing that. I really want to speak to that because what type of relationship do you think that that helps form with the people and the companies that you guys are working with? You know, I can't say for everyone. I could certainly say from my own perspective, part of when I joined on deck, part of what I liked was I came from an entrepreneurial family, right? Mm. My dad owned, owned his own small business. Yeah. And then after I did a couple of things in life, at one point I actually started my own business. So I think a lot of the people at On Deck, if they didn't come from that background, certainly have a, have a, some endearment for it. But a lot of us are entrepreneurial at heart, even though the company may be a little bit bigger than some entrepreneurial companies right now, now yeah. not good. You know, I think a, we, a lot of us feel that way and came from that background. So when we're talking to the customers, maybe that comes through. Yeah. You know, um, we're, we're definitely there for them. Right. You know, it's like any other business, you know, without our customer, we don't exist. Right. So, you know, it's not like they need us. It's, mm -hmm. it's you know, we need them. We, we have to service, uh, provide a service to them. So I think it comes through. Mm -hmm. um, I think more than the way it comes through, it's just we understand what they need. Yeah. We spend a lot of time trying, you know, trying to understand what is it that they need? What are the products that they need? What are the, the the features that they need that we've geared our product toward, which is hopefully why they've accepted it right. uh, and, and our customers like working for us, which is different than going to a financial institution, which is kind of like, hey, here's what we got. Yeah. You know, these are our products, you know, they may or may not be made for you, but this is what we offer. Right. It's that customer first mentality. Yeah, definitely. You mentioned that this was this is something that had never been done before and they had no idea if it was gonna work or not. What do you think made them believe in the product? I think just knowing, you know, from their own backgrounds, knowing that the demand existed. Yeah. It's like it's a weird I wish I could think of the next product where, you know, to, right. to be the next one. But it's weird where you know the demand is there. Yeah. It's just you're trying to figure out how do we provide it right you know how can we meaningfully provide and easily provide it and that was the whole basis of building the online platform right? yeah. if we were going to do it where like a normal typical application method we'd be nothing more than just bank number 27 right right this was all about how do you build it online so it was uh, you know I'm kind of trying to get in Mitch's head which I mean, <laughs> of course probably yeah. can't do um, but it's, it's I think it's a matter of knowing that the demand was there right. there was there was no it was, this was nothing hidden that we you know fished out under a rock right. oh my god small businesses need need capital yeah it was you know the needs there right but nobody could quite figure out how do we actually get it done right and he had the idea this podcast episode is brought to you by our sponsor blue microphones everyone has a story to tell and if you're a storyteller you you probably know Blue Mics for their iconic Yeti microphone, which has helped millions of people find and amplify their voices. If you're thinking about creating your own podcast or recording some voiceovers, then you need to check out Blue's new Yeti caster, the complete mic and boom arm system ready to connect to your laptop, bringing the ultimate broadcast studio setup to your home or office. That's what we use here at the NetSuite Santa Monica studios, and we sound pretty darn good, don't you think? To get your hands on one of these setups, visit bluedesigns.com and use code PODCAST at checkout for a special price. So fast forward to 2014, mm -hmm. company goes public um, and you come on. Mm -hmm. Before we dive into your role, can you give our listeners just some insight into your background so they can understand where you came from as, a, as an entrepreneur and a businessman? Sure. So um, I started as a, an accountant in what was, I'll give away my age here probably, the big eight at the time. Mm -hmm. uh, I had started with Arthur Anderson. Uh, I was with Arthur Anderson for... I'm old, so my memory is, <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> it takes, you know, six years, left Arthur Anderson. And at that point, that's when I started my own 
business. Got it. Which was uh, diagnostic imaging. You know? mm. So I went out and uh, opened MRI centers and wow. CAT scans and x-rays and nuclear medicine and mammography and sonogram and bone dent. So I, I had some small, uh, uh, I had a small business and started out, you know, with a couple of partners. We had two employees. Yeah. Um, and over the years, I think we were there about, had about seven years, we were about 50 employees. Wow. Um, two or three different centers. So, um, again, that's from my family background of my dad was a, a, a trucker and a rigger and I worked with him for many years. So did my little entrepreneurial thing. Sounds very weird to say, but, um, I actually missed the county. Uh, I actually liked it. Where did the passion for this new area come from? Where did you see the vision in that? It was actually a, a friend of mine had a uh, diagnostic imaging center at the time. Got it. And back, this is now in the mid 90s, uh, the physician practice management companies were the darlings of Wall Street. They were the types of companies back then that were raising hundreds of millions of dollars at a, at a clip. And they were buying up mm -hmm. imaging centers. And he was a, a very, very smart guy. He had a lot, a lot of street smart. I mean, Columbia MBA, very, very smart guy. Ray, I love you. Wasn't the most polished guy in the world, <laughs> right? Um, so I went on board with them for kind of the purpose of selling them. Mm -hmm. So we actually did complete a sale of, of our, this imaging center to a, a public company. He started the company for like a million bucks. Mm -hmm. And I sold it for him in 97, 98 for about eight million. Wow. So, uh, you know, he's like, well, that was a nice... Nice yeah. little hit. He goes, I think I'm going to do it again. <laughs> and he goes, are you in? And I said, I'm in. Nice. So uh, we wound up doing a second and then yeah. a third and then, uh, you know, just expanded out. And it was great. You know, medical is a tough business. Yeah. Uh, you know, anyone who's gone to the doctor knows, you know, every year costs go up. Right. Right. Same thing. And, and every year insurance reimbursements set, seem to come down. Mm -hmm. uh, so the lines don't always cross. You know, your reimbursements you're getting from insurance companies are coming down, but every year your rent goes up and your, right. your payroll goes up. So that business I was in became one where you really needed pretty massive scale. Yeah. You know, it was hard to make it with two or three right. centers. You needed 20. Yeah. So we wound up selling off and uh, I wound up joining a um, public software company down in North Carolina for a while. Wow. So I was down there, beautiful place. Yeah. And then uh, wound up coming back up to New York uh -huh. and joined up with a, what was at the time, the third largest private leasing company in the country doing all publicly registered funds. So we had, you know, a couple billion dollars in assets under management and the complicated stuff, the SEC, you know, SEC reporting and then leases and, and uh, structured finance. And then I wound up in 2014 getting pulled into, glad, uh, happily to say so, into <laughs> On Deck. Interesting. Um, and they had just gone public, right. and that just completely changed their needs yeah. uh, from, you know, kind of an accounting and a finance perspective. And uh, some people knew some people who knew me, and mm. I guess they were talking around a water cooler, and phone calls got made. <laughs> and the next thing you know, I was started at On Deck three days prior to the IPO. Wow. Yeah, very nice to be at work on your third day and literally like covered in champagne. Oh my gosh, that's crazy. Yeah. What was it about On Deck that made you want to join the team? A couple of things. I mean, I think... You know, as I mentioned, a lot of people there are very entrepreneurial, right? Mm -hmm. I sat down on one on my interviews with the CFO and the CEO, and you know, you're at a company that's just about to go public, and you're interviewing there, and they're in jeans and a button down and a sweater, and I think the CEO put one foot up on a chair, you know, kind of while he was interviewing me, and just really good people, no, you know, fake air about anyone, and just genuinely honest. Uh, and, and genuine people. Yeah. Uh, and it just made it a comfortable place to be. And having come from an entrepreneurial background, both myself as well as uh, my, my parents, you, you look at the company and you're like, wow, if this existed when my dad had his company or I had my company, it might have been a game changer. Right. You know, having access to things, to, to capital that you didn't have back then, this is phenomenal. Yeah. This really can change the playing field for small businesses out there. So it made me want to be there. Yeah. Uh, and, and hopefully that's what we've been doing. Yeah. And there's an emotional tie there. I can, I can oh. sense. Oh yeah. yeah. It, like I said, it's the, the people that work there. It's, it's great to enjoy your job. It's even better to enjoy going to work and be around the people that you're with. Mm -hmm. And yeah, it's great to sit down at the end of the day and say, look, we're, you know, we're achieving a good thing, yeah. uh, which we are, mm -hmm. but it's also great. Just the people that are phenomenal. Yeah. And do you find that often in this industry? Uh, sometimes. Yeah. I can <laughs> imagine. I can imagine. And it's different strokes for different folks. Of some, course. Some folks like suits and buttoned up and, you know, I'm almost in a suit now. It's yeah. what I tend to be a little bit more comfortable. It's easier to get dressed in the morning. There's less to match. Right. Um, it really is a family. 
I love that. That's yeah. awesome. So you walked in and like you said, December 2014 as the principal accounting officer. Mm-hmm. Where did the company stand in the industry overall? Well, even at that point, because it was a very niche industry, mm-hmm. to a certain respect, I hope this doesn't come across the wrong way, they kind of were the industry, you know. There were a few big big players out there, and there, yeah. there still are, but they were one of the more well-known. Um, so they were an industry leader, hopefully still yeah. are. You guys were the category kings. You created this category yeah. at On Deck, and yeah. that's we talk a lot about that at NetSuite and with our execs because this new kind of idea of entrepreneurship, does this exist already? And if it doesn't, how am I going to create it, right. this new design to, to an extent again there were there were some you know there were a top three or four right. other players out there uh, we were the only ones at the time uh, going public I think lending club went about the same time but they're consumers mm-hmm. right so that's lending to individuals we were purely small business so when I entered uh, you know on deck again you know they were just about to go public so they put a lot of effort into doing so they just brought me on for the specific purpose of preparing them for after they're public Got you know that you know kind of things change and and uh, reporting to you know all of a sudden having the SEC as your new policeman on the on, on the block it's good to have someone who's you know had that experience which right. I've had for for many many years so kind of knew what to expect um, having done it before how to set it up because you know reporting as a public company is is this thing that never goes away. You know, it seems like every time you turn around, you're in another reporting period. So, you know, my role coming in was just basically get us set up to to be able to efficiently and accurately report, mm-hmm. um, you know, meet our regulatory requirements. Um, accounting has become, over the, the years, extraordinarily hard mm-hmm. um, and complicated. You know, back 20 years ago, the CFO of a company was always kind of the, the main bean counter, right? right. The, head, the head accountant. Uh, but then finance got so complex and accounting got so complex that the two roles have, di- have diverged over time. So you have a chief financial officer and a chief accounting officer because they're both so specialized. Right. So, you know, I was able to come in and part of my role is to bring in that knowledge of, of, of complex accounting and technical accounting and financial reporting. And, you know, having set this up before at other companies mm-hmm. uh, of getting them getting them set up to to succeed. Yeah. So you you walk into a pretty successful company, obviously, with the IPO and everything else. What challenges did you face, you know, especially in terms of, of the accounting side of things and, and tracking and and data? What were there any challenges there? Uh, there's always one of the biggest challenges you face coming in is, you know, you're doing an IPO. You know, obviously you want to get out there. You want to get the IPO done, but you, you build up to it. And then when you're ready, you pull the trigger and you go Mm -hmm. public. Once you're public, um, there's pretty tight deadlines, right? Mm -hmm. So it's not only do you have to report, um, but you have to report pretty quick. Yeah. Right. And, uh, and, you know, being able to, uh, a challenge is being able to gather the data. You know, I mean, you just look at on deck where there's tens of thousands of, of outstanding loans at any point in time. And some of these, you know, making daily or weekly payments over the course of days, weeks, months, that's a lot of data. Yeah. Um, and so it's just a matter of, of aggregating the data, making sense of the data. And, you know, and let, just to make it more complicated, you want to get it right. Right, of know? course, of uh, course. So uh, it was just, you know, I think making the, putting the processes in place. Yeah. There, there's no rocket science to, 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 to accounting, you know, yeah. once you understand it. Um, it's the process of doing it over and over. Yeah. And like anything else, you want to have the processes in place where if person A leaves and person B steps in, they know what to do. Got it. They know what the person before them did. So it was really setting up processes, protocols, procedures, um, you know, looking at them from a risk point of view and saying, where are our risks? Yeah. You know, as a business, that's what you always want to manage. You want to, you have to manage risk. So first things first is what are they? Yeah. You know, what are the major risks? You know, and then you kind of weigh the risk. What's the most significant and the least significant? And you put your resources towards addressing the risks. But you got to have them laid out where it's a procedure, mm-hmm. you know, and so that you you know pretty much like you know it's it's now early July we're going to be closing the quarter I know right now exactly where we stand I know when books will be closed I know when first drafts will be done I know pretty much for the next 45 days right. what's going to happen day by day right um, that's what you need to know yeah. you know you can't you know we're accountants we're conservative by nature for the most part. We like to not guess. Right. You know, we like to know what's going to happen. We like to be prepared. We're like the Boy Scouts of the business world. So uh, it's all about just setting up the, the, the procedures so that there is no surprise. So what systems did you guys have in place when you came on um, in, in 2014 to make sure that you could track, you know, all of this? 
Well, when I came on in 2014, we already had NetSuite in place. I think we had just prior to my joining, give or take a year or so, uh -huh. converted off of, I think they were originally on QuickBooks, uh, and then uh, they were on uh, uh, Microsoft Dynamics for a short while, and then they had converted over to Microsoft, I, I want to say in like 2013 or Got something it. like that. So I came in, you know, fortunately to a pretty... Uh, already set up system. Converted it over to NetSuite. It was converted by 20, off to NetSuite already. I mean, I've done conversions before. <laughs> Never a ton of fun. <laughs> you ever get a chance to do that, skip it. But from what I understand, you know, when they did convert over, it was pretty pretty seamless. Yeah. Um, you know, it was just basically getting all that data loaded in. And, and like many other things, particularly softwares and stuff, it's more about the setup yeah. than anything else. Get the setup, put the time into the setup, and the rest it runs pretty smoothly. Like you said, you came in three days before the IPO. Mm -hmm. How did you meet those deadlines as being an employee of three days? Did NetSuite help you meet the deadlines that you had to meet pretty quickly after that? Mostly because I'm brilliant. You know, <laughs> of course, I, I, of that's course. That's going to be my canned answer. Okay, um, great. <laughs> I'd like to say it was all me. Well, uh, to answer your question, when I did get in there, there were people that were there mm -hmm. prior to my third day. Right, of course. Um, so they, they, pretty, they had some really smart people there. Um, I think, you know, what I was able to bring to the table was more the experience of, you know, what do you need to do mm -hmm. time and time again, and, and where are you wasting your time, and where can we be more efficient, and, and then just, you know, in foreign reporting goes, how do you build this thing? Right. I mean, we were doing it manually in Word yeah. and Excel, and yeah, just, no. um, so I was able to bring in other systems to do that, but, um, yeah, I think NetSuite was already set up, and I think one of the things that was great about NetSuite was we were able to integrate it with a lot of the other systems we were using, like even some of our proprietary loan platform mm -hmm. systems we were able to get data out of. Uh, Salesforce was one of our, 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 C, our CRM that we were able to pull data out of. Um, so it was pretty easy to get some of the stuff integrated. ADP, all mm -hmm. these different uh, uh, platforms and softwares that we were using, were able to integrate. So, you know, where you can automate, you're always better off than doing things manually, right? right. It, it, it makes it more efficient, reduces risk. You know, there's no, no fat finger or number when you're keying in a number. Uh, the integrations are always what you want to build off of. Right. Um, what components of NetSuite do you use other than the ability to kind of bring in those other systems? Uh, not as many as probably I want to use. Yeah. And that, that's, you know, kind of an initiative we're, we're undertaking right now. NetSuite is, you know, I kind of, uh, I jokingly sometimes say NetSuite is a Ferrari and sometimes we're driving it like a Toyota. Mm -hmm. um, it, it has so many capabilities and we're, we're when I came on board, they were really using it um, very much the general ledger portion, accounts payable, cash, the cash module, um, the, the, kind of the nuts and bolts. Mm -hmm. uh, there's lots more in it that we are going to take advantage of, and that's some of the initiative I put uh, in front of my team. Mm -hmm. You know, the uh, project management, uh, inventory, receivables, revenues. There's many different modules that we can use that we're right now, even as long as we've been using NetSuite, which is only a couple of years, really. Right. Um, there's it's like it's it's a menu it's it's actually kind of funny that there's so much that it can do um that you know you, you don't want to take it all on because right, like lot, anything yeah. else would never be able to use every every piece of it nor would we really have a need i don't have inventory right, right? i don't have boxes and crates and warehouses so right. i don't need inventory modules but yet they're there yeah um so it's just a matter of kind of cherry picking the ones we need to use so we're using the 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 ones that we needed to use in the beginning mm -hmm. to be able to meet our needs but as we've gotten more complex and we're trying to grow our efficiencies, you know, one of the things we're doing right now, and we're working quite closely with, with NetSuite um, on a big project right now of finding out, okay, where can we do things better? How can we better use NetSuite? What are we doing manually that, you know, oh, there's a module for that. Yeah. Um, so I want to say it was the, it's the ACS team. Yep. What is it, right? Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay. Um, Advanced Customer Support team. There yeah. you go. I just stick to the, to the, to the, <laughs> the acronyms. To the acronyms, right. Um, so we're doing a, you know, a big project with them right now to figure out, hey, right now we're doing it this way and we're doing it manually and we're making journal entries. Like, hey, that can be automated. You know, we right. can automate that and, and pull data from our system and run it through the black box that needs to automate it and pull it in automatically. So I think we have probably a 12-month project ahead of us right now that we're in the, in the just started. To, to make better use of the software. Wow, that's a lot. Yeah. It's yeah, a lot it's, to take on, especially, you know, with when you're heading it up, I'm sure. <laughs> yeah, and, I, you know, I'd, I'd love to say that we're, you know, I have 95 accountants sitting right. in my office that are twiddling their thumbs and have nothing to do but uh, work on special projects. But, you know, even though we may be a little bit of a bigger company uh, yeah. as opposed to some of the smaller businesses out there, you know, we, we run, try and run efficiently. So. Right. I have my team that's able to do, you know, we have a certain amount of resource. Right. So if I had unlimited resources, I might be able to install and get right, all these right. modules up and running in three months. But, you know, we're doing it when uh, we have to allocate 
uh, time and resources. So it'll probably take us about 12 months. How has it helped you on the accounting side of things or the business in general work more efficiently? Well, I think definitely, look, you know, anything you have to do manually is risky, Yeah. right? And for the most part, inefficient. There's science and there's art. When there's art involved, you can't automate it, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, no one wants a picture to hang in their living room that was necessarily drawn by a robot off a stencil or something like that. Right. And there are, I like to say in accounting, there are aspects of art. Mm -hmm. You know, it is not an exact science. Uh, there is lots of interpretation and, and lots of thought that goes into it. And some of it is, you know, you can ask an accounting question to five different people and get five different answers. Right. Um, but to the parts that are kind of time consuming and low value add, right? That's where automation really is best served. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I know probably my company and I would venture to say 99.99% of every other company that's out there from the smallest to the biggest like Apple and, and what use Excel, let's say. Yeah. Um, which is a manual thing. Uh, yeah. You know, I know from in our world, the SEC and stuff like that, it's 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 a red flag. I yeah. mean, they're, they're just, you do things manually in Excel, and as much as Excel adds things up, you know, so you don't have to add it up. You can't make a mistake adding it up. You're putting numbers in manually. Right. right? You could type one in the wrong way. There can I will guarantee that if anyone goes in and looks at your Excel sheets, ninety percent of them have an error in it somewhere. Right. right. So there's always risk when you're doing things manually. The more that you can actually build the automation in a controlled fashion, and that's the that's the important thing is you can't just say, well, I'll pull the data out of system one, I'll pull it into NetSuite, and wow, I'm automated. You have to be thorough, it has to be tested, you have to do these things in the sandbox, right? right. You have to make sure that as curveballs get thrown at them and there's different, you know, the data came in one way as opposed to another way, that the automation can handle it. Mm -hmm. uh, and you have to test it. Do the formulas work? Do they work right all the time? You know, it's not a kind of a one and done kind of thing. Once you can thoroughly put a plan in place, here's how I'm going to build it out. Here's how I'm going to test it. Um, you know, when you run it in parallel for a little bit of while, a little while, then you can kind of cut over to it. That's where the efficiencies start to come around. Not only efficiencies, but you you start to control risk. Right. And that's an enormous thing because just a lot of times, silly things that happen are just mistakes. Yeah. Right. Someone didn't mean to make a mistake. Right. But something didn't work right. So I added something wrong. I didn't take that into account. As you automate it, it's kind of one of those things, I don't have to think about it anymore. I've built it into the automation. Mm. There is no automation that's going to, going to be able to properly handle 100% of the situations 100% of the time. Right. If you're aiming for that, you're gonna wind up in like that analysis paralysis. You're never gonna get there. There's gotta be that point where it's like, ah, this automation will handle 98% of the situations. Right. And I'll have to deal with the 2%. That's better than dealing with the ninety, the, the ninety-eight or the hundred percent. Yeah. So you know, it's just, and it's a never-ending process. Like in my office, we can have everything automated and great, and all things all well and good. Twelve months from now, things will have changed. Right. You know, we will be using new data sources. Something will have changed in the industry. It, it's a never-ending evolution, mm -hmm. and and I think that's a mistake sometimes that can be made as well. Which is, well, I have it automated, set it and forget it. You know, and you walk away, and oh. It's worked. Yeah. It's worked before. Why wouldn't it work now? Right. You know, it's there's the the you know the adage if it's not broke don't fix it. Right. Well, there's the other adage that if it's not broke, break it yourself, and fix it now before it uncontrollably breaks and now you're reacting as opposed to being proactive. Right. So it, automation is just clearly the way you need to go, and that's part of growing your business. Too. Right. You know, if you're spending, particularly small business people, time spending spent at your desk trying to figure out books and records and whatever that's not time growing your business right right that's that's the time you want to avoid and how do you do that you, you know you automate where you can if you've ever met a famous athlete at a corporate event or gotten an official autograph chances are steiner sports made it happen here's brandon steiner we believe that there's magic in the moments that sports creates we get customers closer to the game and help companies use the power of sports to grow their business. We've been in business 30 years and we've had multiple systems to keep track of all the athletes and all of our customers. Multiple systems means multiple headaches. So we made the move to NetSuite by Oracle. NetSuite lets us replace all of our finance, inventory, and CRM functions with one convenient system. Now all the departments can see the same data. And if I have a question about our business, I can get the answer quickly.
This month, NetSuite is offering a free 60-minute business review with an expert in your industry to identify opportunities to turbocharge your growth. To get your free review, go to netsuite.com slash steiner. That's netsuite.com slash steiner. netsuite.com slash steiner. Instead of spending, you know, 14 hours at the office, where do you spend that other time now? I have kids, so once I get out of work, I go to a different work. <laughs> I am apparently also an Uber driver. Oh, got it. Uh, right, you know, right, I have right. teenage kids. Can you take me here? Can you take yeah. me there? In all seriousness, when I'm out of work, and, and that's another thing I love about On Deck is, I, you know, we work hard. Yeah. Um, and we're there when we need to be, but they're they're very um, uh, aware of that people do have personal lives. Right. You know, I think just two weeks ago, my mother passed away. Oh, I'm sorry um, to hear that. And, you know, I literally called my boss yeah and you know i'm like i'll, I'll, I'll maybe i'll come in tomorrow but i'm gonna need the day for the and they're like no you, wow you know take care of what you need to take care of we got it yeah you know hand off the football we got it for do what you need to do uh which was great right um so that that is certainly a nice thing and i'm i'm you know of that age now where i'm getting to where i don't want to work 80 hours no. a week i can't do it anymore um but you know i still like you know, I still is I still get up at four in the morning. Yep. You know, because uh, if you don't go to the gym in the morning, you know, you never get there. Exactly. I still play play baseball. I still play hockey. Uh, as I said, I'm running around chasing the kids all the time. Mm-hmm. I get this color at the beach, so I do spend <laughs> some time relaxing. Um, it, you know, work life balance is important. Yeah. Um, I've certainly learned that over the years. Mm-hmm. Uh, and uh, you know, trying as I've gotten on in years. Not saying that I'm terribly old, but. Um, <laughs> certainly appreciate more spending the time with, with the family and the friends uh, right. uh, as opposed to just Being locking right. myself in yeah. an office and working 20 hours a day. Exactly. Kind of on that same little bit of the personal level, what is it about, aside from the business, aside from the efficiencies, what is it about NetSuite that you enjoy in terms of working with the people? Look, I mean, NetSuite, uh, what I like about working with those folks is, um, you know, they've worked with small companies, you know, uh, they work with big companies. Yeah. So when I have a need, they're able to say, okay, here's that kind of person who's worked in that niche before and, and who knows what you're probably going to be the best service. Um, they're easy to work with. Mm. It is, it's, it's a big piece of software, but let, let's not lie, right? So it's not just like, oh, I want to learn how to use a new feature and they don't, you know, email you over a one page and say, oh, here, you're good. You know, it does take time to turn things on and, yeah. and train people, but th- they do have uh, resources for everything. So I've always enjoyed working with them. You know, mm-hmm. I've worked with you guys quite a bit in numbers of different speeches here or presentations right. there. Uh, gets me out of my office, which yeah. we talked about I like to do. Yeah. Um, but no, it's, it's, it's great people. They understand the business. They'll take the time. They have special groups that will actually come in and not just know NetSuite, but they'll come in first to spend time understanding your business. Mm. Right? It, it's not a one-size-fits-all. You can't just take NetSuite in, plug it in, and walk away. You, know, you have to understand the business and, and kind of uh, adapt NetSuite to be able to serve the need um, that you have. Mm-hmm. They've just done a, a good job for us over the years. I've always been pleased. You know, I make references for NetSuite quite a bit. I got to go back to my office and make one pretty soon. <laughs> um, so uh, you know, look, it's just a it's just a good company to work with. Yeah. yeah. And you mentioned talking about the changes that you know could happen in the industry. You know, next year, two days, a week, whatever it is. Why do you trust working with NetSuite? to help you continue to scale amid these changes? It's just been very easy for us to adapt as we've, as we've grown. Mm. Uh, we've grown both domestically, we've grown internationally. Yeah. So when we open up an office in, 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 in Australia and we're able to say, hey, we just got to get them on. It's, I mean, there's no cable to run. I mean, you know, hey, do you guys have, you guys have Wi-Fi? <laughs> yeah, we do. Okay, we'll get you up and running on NetSuite. Um, you know, send someone down there, which unfortunately was not me, um, you know, to kind of get them up to speed on it. It's just, it's easy to do as we're adding entities. It's just been very scalable, I think uh-huh. is, is, is the right word. Yeah. And as we've grown and as we've needed new features and, you know, we've been able to kind of toggle them on and off as we've needed. So it's just been very simple. It's scaled with us. Mm-hmm. Um, we have a lot of runway yet to go with it. Yeah. Uh, I look forward to the day when I outgrow it. I don't <laughs> see it in my immediate future. Um, Cause it, 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 again, there's, it's got a lot of bandwidth. Yeah. We've got a lot that we can do with it. Yeah. It's just been a, a good tool to work with. Can you speak to that international scalability that you, you kind of commented on? Cause I know that's something that NetSuite has helped you guys do. How is yeah. that? 
it, it was actually very nice to work with. Um, I've done international operations before at other places where you you want to pull your hair out. You know, you know it's it's not <laughs> those eighty only, hour work weeks. <laughs> yeah, it's you know once you go really outside of your own four walls, there's there's numbers of challenges you face, right? Mm-hmm. Some of some of it may simply be getting your information, particularly when they're on different systems, right? And a lot of companies where they do have it may be international, it may even be different operations domestically, but you're all on different platforms. Mm-hmm. Who's on, you know, NetSuite here, PeopleSoft there, mm-hmm. Hyperion there, JD Edwards there. You have different systems and, you know, they don't talk. Right. Um, so now you, someone's, someone's got the unlucky job of pulling it all together. Um, so when you have a system like NetSuite and you're able to just say, look, we want to get you up and running on our platform, you know, it's web-based, so, you know, there's data transfers. We have real-time visibility mm-hmm. into what's going. It's not like, you know, when you have a subsidiary somewhere else, you're like, hey, send us your, you know, kind of records once right. a month, their reporting package. We can all see it. Yeah. You know, obviously, where there's security, so you can check yeah. who can see what and whatever. But you're all in the same system. Yeah. So there's visibility. Uh, it's great in that there's backup, right? Mm-hmm. Someone, in, someone, oh, we're a little short-staffed and what you have the right pro, uh, procedures in place, you're all doing things the same way, well, we can do it for you. Mm-hmm. You know, we'll just make those entries for you. Or mm-hmm. We'll do those reconciliations for you. And one of the nicest features was the foreign currencies, mm. right? Uh, if, if anyone's ever had to deal with foreign currencies, I feel for you, you know, and, and the complexities of, of, of dealing with different functional currencies or, or whether you have foreign transactions. NetSuite does a good job of basically taking care of a lot of that for you. Mm. It'll do the translations for you. It'll do the remeasurements for you. It'll track your CTA and all that good stuff. See, how's my accounting lingo. <laughs> See, I do know what I'm talking about. Yeah, Actually, you okay. do. You don't just close your eyes to it. Obviously, you have to check it. And, right. But so far, we have yet to find where anything really went horribly wrong. Yeah. So in that respect, particularly international for, for that one reason alone, the, the foreign currency, but whether it's international or domestic, just the ability to get people on the same platform mm-hmm. uh, is almost priceless. Right. Just, you know, having done it before where you have people reporting in manually because at that point that's really what you have Mm -hmm. you know everything is not in the same system so somehow you got to get it out of one system and into another system and that rarely happens seamlessly right so you're touching a lot of data once you start touching and manipulating things that's where risk risk increases so to be able to get everyone again you know you know we have multiple offices in the u.s we have multiple offices outside of the u.s to be able to get them all in the same system uh following uh, the same procedures since we're using the same tool, mm-hmm. you know, we can all train each other, train ourselves the, the same way. Right. Um, so there's no, well, they're doing it one way, we're doing it a different way, and now we have apples and oranges. Yeah. Um, since we're using the same tool, we train ourselves the same way. Um, we have real-time visibility. It's just a, a huge time saver, uh, risk mitigator, mm-hmm. uh, all, all, the, all the good buzzwords. All of it. All of it. <laughs> and what about it being a cloud-based solution? Coming from the old days, I was always a premise-based guy. Right. Right. And when I came on uh, at OnDeck and they had NetSuite, I'm like, okay, this is a, new. this is new. Okay, I'm, I'm I'm not so old that I can't adapt. Okay, <laughs> let's let's see what it can do. And it actually turned out to be great for a lot of reasons. Uh, one of the the biggest, which I'm sure you guys tout as well, is we didn't have to do when we had on-premise software. Just oh my god, the annual upgrades. Yeah. Oh uh, gosh. We're, we're just you, you, again. Uh, there's so many things apparently that I've wanted to pull my hair out over. <laughs> But just literally upgrading from version four to version five, and you yeah. got to take the system down, and you got to convert everything over, and it, all that went away, right? All the upgrades are done behind the scenes. We're just using the cloud-based product. Has been great. I think, not to downplay it, but I think one of my favorite things about being on a cloud-based platform is my team. Yeah. Uh, and what I mean by that is, it allows me a lot more flexibility because mm. we do have instances where. Someone has a child care issue. Yeah. Someone doesn't feel well. Um, you know, whatever, you know, someone has to go take care of something important. I just had one of my people buying a house. I have to go out and I have to run, you know, and we're moving all these things. Great, go. And then, you know, I'll log on later. Yeah. You know, or I have to be home for my, for my kids, you know, and babysitter called in sick or whatever. Everyone has access from everywhere. And we have a pretty robust security team mm. at on deck from, from an IT perspective. So for it to meet, all those requirements says a lot. Yeah. They're like, no, you got, it's good. Yeah. You're good to go. So I think as much as it has a lot of technological advances, you know, advantages of all the data is stored. We don't have to worry about storage. We don't have to worry about servers. I don't have to worry about upgrades. And yes, all good. To me, I'm like a, I try and sometimes keep it as simple as possible. Um, I let the IT folks worry about all the tech stuff. To me, it's just a huge people 
yeah. uh, benefit yeah. of just being, you know, come to work, you got to do it. If you can't be at work, you can do it remotely. We've had people log in from vacation. I hate to say that, that people have had to log in vacation, <laughs> but things happen. So I think in that respect, just the, the, the flexibility you get yeah. from it, there's just no replacing it. You know, Nick, I, I hate to tell you this, but all of this is telling me that you actually could be living on a private island somewhere and still doing your job. <laughs> uh, I, there's got to be Wi-Fi. <laughs> okay, I, if I'm going to be on a private island, and I'm go- <laughs> yeah. I don't want Wi-Fi. I want to be living on a remote island and fishing. You know? yeah. yeah. And, you know, to wrap things up a little bit, we talked about how On Deck was started by, you know, a couple people, a small business, NetSuite started by a couple people, a small business. How is it working with a company like NetSuite that has been in your guys' shoes before? It's always been pleasant. You know, I get good results from Mm -hmm. them. There are always challenges. Yeah. There is no relationship that is perfect. Right. Right. But it's great when you're working with a company that does want to be there for you and, Mm -hmm. and actually wants you to succeed, not because it's good for them, but because it's good for you. Yeah. Um, And I think that carries over a lot to on deck as well you know mm-hmm. we're, we're trying to do it for for them and that really is sincere you know we succeed when our customers succeed yeah not the other way around yeah um, and it's great to work with NetSuite as well as they're they they want you to succeed mm-hmm. um, and that's always uh, you know always come through um, we're working like I said the next 12 months we're going to be working a lot more on that yeah but it's been a big part of our ability to scale and grow mm-hmm. and you know be successful so where is Holland deck headed in the future Hopefully uh, a million different places. And I keep trying to tell them, let's open in Italy. Um, <laughs> Not for personal I, reasons. No, 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 no. But, you know, I do have a place to stay. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, hey, hey, I'll save money on, uh, I'll save money on hotels. Um, no, I mean, I think, look, we want to just keep doing what exactly what it is we're doing and do it better every day. Yeah. Uh, we want to keep getting money into the hands of small businesses. Uh, we want to keep seeing them succeed. And we want to see them grow. And when they grow, that's what will make us grow, not the other way around. We are dependent. Our lifeline is is serving them. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and we need to be able to do that better and better every day, which is what we strive to do. That's why everyone is in our office. I wonder if I could see it from here at the window. <laughs> no, but it is a, you're right. It is a nice day. Uh, that's why we come to work every day. Mm-hmm. Uh, and, and it's great to be you know with that group of people that really strive every day to come in to do that and to be there for the customer. It's, mm-hmm. it's great to hear it in our office. It's like, what does the customer want? What does the customer need? Not, you know, what do we need to, right. to, to it's what do they need? Um, and when you can get 500 people together uh, that all have that same mindset, you know, you asked the earlier question, what do companies need to do to grow and succeed? Yeah. That's kind of it. You know, you really all, you, you gotta be, you know, uh, working on that goal of taking care of the customer and taking care of that someone else. Yeah. Uh, and that's how you succeed. Yeah. I love that. Yeah. And on that note, uh-huh. I think we just got to call it. That was That's some solid advice right there. There you go. So thank you so much for coming in today, Nick. And it's it's exciting to be in New York and, and hanging with you. And so uh, hopefully we'll have you on again sometime. Be my pleasure. I would love it. All right. Thank you, everybody, for tuning in. Don't forget to rate, review, and subscribe this podcast. And we will talk to you soon. Let me repeat that last bit of advice for you. In order to grow and succeed, companies need to continue working on taking care of their customers, putting them first, and giving them the best possible experience. Thank you so much to Nick Sinegalia for joining us on this week's episode of the NetSuite Podcast. I'd also like to thank our sponsors at The Second City, Blue Mics, and Steiner Sports, as well as our editors over at Lampstand, and all of you for tuning in. Talk to you next time. You just listened to the NetSuite podcast. Be sure to tune in every week with more NetSuite developments, stories, and insights into the benefits of one integrated system to help you run your business.